Hi guys, so today I wanted to cover the material for analysis in chapter 13 of The Dressmaker, and as always, we'll be centering our analysis on how it can be compared with The Crucible. So before we jump into our analysis, here's a summary of chapter 13. So we see the wedding preparations for Gertrude and William's wedding. We see the wedding itself. Um, and in the process, we get a flashback from Tilly, which reveals to us what happened between her and Stuart Pettyman. And we see the post-marital kind of dynamic between the Beaumonts, which acts as a harbinger of great changes in the Beaumont household. Let's put it like that. And before I get started, there's one more thing that I want to get into. So Sandy said, hi, could you please include page references to the quotes, these videos are very helpful. To which I say, yes. Initially, I was like, well, students are studying from different books, but then I was like, you know what, why not? It takes minimal effort for me to type in page numbers. But here's a little disclaimer. I am using the very ugly 2015 version of the book with the picture of a grey scale empire waist dress with no shape to it. Fun fact, I went down to the QBD to buy this book and the lady at the counter said, we have this in two covers. I see one that I like better than the other. I think you'll like this one better too, so I'll give you this one. That was a lie because the one with Kate Winslet on the cover is a lot prettier and she was just probably being shady. Anyway, so into chapter 13, we see William Beaumont planning to mend some fences with the um, money that he may be able to leverage out of the wedding. Essentially, he hopes that the wedding will um, convince Mr. Pratt to kind of let the, the, uh, the Beaumont's credit at the store, kind of the water under the bridge, um, so he's hoping to use the, the value that he extracts out of the marriage to mend some fences, and that's literal, but also figurative, because he wants to kind of um, get over the, the amount of money that his family owes to the Pratt family through the marriage. Um, and there's this little quote here where it says, Gertrude would adjust, learn, and then there's just an ellipsis right there. So once again, we see Rosalie Hamm use the theory of omission. So what she's implying is that Gertrude is going to be worse off in her new marriage than she was before financially and in terms of her living situation with her family and the dynamic between the people she lives with. Now the next part is actually really funny. So um, William reads her Shakespeare's sonnet 130 and Gertrude doesn't get it, so she says that she likes it because it's shorter than his other sonnets. But what she doesn't know is that she just got roasted, she just got read the house down, she got obliterated, her wig was snatched, it flew, her wig was found on Mars. So I'm going to read you a snippet of what Shakespeare writes in Sonnet 130. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts be done? If hairs be wise, black wires grow on her head. And the modern translation of that is, My wife's eyes are ugly. My wife's lips are ugly. My wife's hair is ugly. So she doesn't know it, but she's just being read. Um, <laughs> now we see a delineation between the emotional, sexual, and the need for performative affection between couples here. So she says, kiss me, William, you haven't kissed me in ages, on page 117. And we also see that her eyes puckered like burst apricots when he um, mentioned the possibility of her reconsidering or delaying their marriage for a while. So here, what I mean by delineating the emotional needs and the sexual needs, as well as the need for performative affection, is that while she controls sex in their relationship, she seems to want someone to rely on emotionally. Um, but there's also an aspect of her wanting performative affection um, because she essentially believes that if he doesn't marry her, her reputation is going to be ruined. But beyond that, she wants to present an image of marital felicity 
meaning uh, marital bliss, so that there's no question as to her, um, her kind of, I suppose you could put it like, there's no doubt that she is keeping her man happy, essentially. Um, but it's clear that regardless of all this, William is having second thoughts because he suggests delaying their marriage further. Now, we also see that the Proctor's relationship also delineates these three facets of the dynamic between the two. But um, I suppose the only comment I would make on that is that um, John Proctor and Elizabeth Proctor don't feel the need to perform affection for other people simply for the sake of social nicety. Um, Elizabeth performs the role of a dutiful wife um, because she wants to protect the honour of her husband, whom she genuinely has affection for. That's why we see that she lies to the court to protect his honour, but in doing so, ironically condemns him. So, um, despite this minor difference, the delineation between these three aspects of their relationships is similarly shown through overt character actions and dialogue. So we know from what I've kind of said so far that Rosalie Ham likes to um, kind of play around with her words and her formatting in a novel. She likes to make play around with subtext. She likes to make implications, whereas Arthur Miller likes to put everything on the table for us and kind of have it all there in words for us to know. Despite the overall difference in their styles, in this aspect, they similarly show the characters' actions uh, through the actions and dialogue that they have three very different facets to their relationship. Now, um, what I will say about that is that though I keep harping on about the different styles of the authors, that is something that you'll probably need to rely heavily on in your writing, because at the end of the day, this area of study is all about the ways in which, or the ways that, or how the authors kind of get across their meaning. So if you look at the study design, which I'm always gobsmacked and flabbergasted at the amount of year 12s who don't look at their own study design for English, it's all about how the authors create meaning, or the ways in which authors create meaning. But moving on, we see again that there's this kind of reference to Mona being childish. It says the few curves that Mona has on page 118. So again, she's kind of portrayed as this wanton, spoiled child. Um, so Mona is repeatedly kind of referenced as if she was a child who didn't want to be a child. She is sexually more mature than she emotionally is. Um, she, you know, snaps at the heels of the adults. So it's giving us very prostitute vibes, giving us very Ariana Grande vibes, um, but it's also giving us very Abigail vibes. So Abigail, when you consider her dynamic with John Proctor, she is a child compared to him, and he kind of wants to get rid of her. He finds her annoying at worst, or at best, he still has some degree of attraction to her, but wants her to leave him alone so that he can live in peace with his wife. Um, another thing that you should probably note about Gertrude is we see that gradual kind of deterioration from this hardworking, industrious, clever girl to being this soppy mess who is self-important and very pretentious, basically a mini Elsbeth. Like, her and Elsbeth are supposed to kind of mirror each other, except they both think that they're better than each other. It's kind of like a comedic element in this text. But anyway, she says, We'll have the counsellor and Mary Gord Pettyman and the sergeant, but we don't but we needn't bother with the others. She really said needn't like she's the Queen of England. But anyway, so we see that kind of deterioration where she's getting more snooty and she's looking down on people. Um in their speeches that they give, specifically in William's speech, he says, he thanks everyone, he says that about covers everyone. Now, they are being shady, shady boots because there is a sense of intentionality to them leaving out Tilly's name. 
And we see that sense of intentionality where it says every female waited with bated breath for the name of a seamstress or a dressmaker. She wasn't mentioned. And that was said on page 120. So we can interpret that to mean intentionality because it's very directly referenced by Rosalie Hamm, who usually does not like to directly reference things. And we also see the big reveal where we're like, oh, this is what happened with Tilly when she was a kid. So basically, Stuart Pettyman rushed at her like a bull because that's a thing that he does. He's a bit weird. And she steps sideways, he bangs his head into a brick wall, and he dies. Anyway, so, so far we don't know this yet, but we find out later, and then it suddenly all starts to make sense. But towards the end of the novel, we see Stuart Pettyman as kind of the early representation of male power. So, um, Mary Gold Pettyman says that her own son was the reason why she was trapped in a marriage, kind of fettered to her husband. Um, she was, he was the guy who bullied little girls in school and watched her shower. He was kind of a little pervert who took after his father. So he was the early representation of male power, and when he charged at her, she refused to die there on the spot and stepped aside. But this time in her adulthood, when the patriarchy, when the conservative society or the conservative community of Dungatar comes at her, this time she doesn't run, she doesn't sidestep it, she faces it head on, and she overcomes it, and she literally destroys it. And this, um, this flashback really allows us to look at the role of the narrator in the two texts. So both texts have third-person points of view, and you can talk about that in your essay, but those points of view are very different um, when it comes to the narrator. So um, in The Dressmaker, the narrator is a story device that kind of drives the plot and allows insight into the happenings of Dungata without being tied to a physical location or to a character. So he knows more than Tilly does, he knows more than Teddy does, he knows more than individual characters because he's not tied to a specific location, he's not bound by time, and he's not bound by like being tied to a specific character and seeing from the point of view of that character. So you might think that it's tempting to think of him as an omniscient narrator, that means narrator who knows everything, but he almost acts as if he's a limited narrator, um, so that's one that doesn't know everything, because he doesn't reveal everything to us from the very start. He slowly, or he or she, slowly lets us in on the past that's happened here in Dungata. Now you can compare that with the narrator in The Crucible. So in The Crucible there's an omniscient narrator who knows everything, and he introduces our modern moral judgments to a historical context in which they did not originally exist. And more importantly, for our comparison, he allows a thorough mapping of all facets of the play and the history behind the characters um, and their kind of dynamic with each other, and he provides what we call privileged knowledge, that's knowledge that uh, not everyone is privy to. And he also gives us insight into the consequences of the character's actions. So he kind of lays it all on the table for us to see from the very start. So in plain words, the dressmaker shows and the crucible tells. So back to chapter 13, we start to see the kind of post-marital dynamic between Gertrude and William. So, um, we see from their sexual encounter that neither of them are actually satisfied. So, on page 113 to 100, sorry, 123 to 124, I didn't go to school for math, I don't know numbers, sue me. Actually, I shouldn't say that because I'm also a further maths tutor, so I shouldn't be saying that I don't know math. Anyway, so, um, that entire section on page 123 to 124 that starts with a little and then goes to strangely affronted too. Um, that kind of shows us how Gertrude feels about it. She doesn't get any kind of sexual satisfaction. In fact, she finds it kind of icky. So there's this anticipation on her end um, that she gets from the media, um, which isn't fulfilled for her. And then we see that William feels quote unquote 
both satisfied and strangely not. The page number should be 124. I don't know why I haven't included it there, but the same thing goes for him. He is physically satisfied, but on a deeper level, he finds no satisfaction in what he just did. So we see the dynamic of their relationship beginning to form where neither party is truly satisfied with each other, but they're locked in this agreement together. But despite this, William asks Gertrude, are you happy? And she says, I'm happy now. So once again, there's this pretense of marital felicity, which we see carried over to their daughter, Felicity Joy. Speaking of Felicity Joy, Beulah Haradine is nasty and we don't like her because she tried to say that Felicity Joy was conceived out of wedlock, despite the fact that we see in this paragraph that Gertrude was a virgin until she slept with William on the night of their marriage. So, Beulah Haradine is gross, we don't like her, she's spreading rumours about a child who was literally just born, but anyway. Now, Elspeth is really shooketh. She is just really, really shooketh over the fact that Gertrude is now a member of their family. So, um, and Gertrude says, oh, oh, I need to shop for new linens for our curtains, and Elspeth says they were perfectly adequate for me. Now, this lets us in on the kind of dynamic that's happening here, because it suggests that Elspeth had to vacate her room for Gertrude and William to occupy once they got married. So, um, it's essentially a symbolic takeover of her role as the matriarch of the family, and we see her literally, quote-unquote, put back in a rightful place, which is something that William says when he goes to um, organise the marriage with Elton Pratt. He, sa he says, oh, that'll put her back in a rightful place. So, um, we also see this kind of fear at now no longer being the matriarch and having to suck up to Gertrude because she has money and by extension she has power in their family. Um, said money is obviously courtesy of her father. Uh, when it says that the colour drained completely from uh, Elspeth's face when Mona says that she wants to go shopping with Gertrude because Gertrude has a blank check from her dad. So this kind of acts as a great segue into talking about space and power, because in the Beaumont home, space is power, and that's why we see Mona throw a tantrum when Gertrude gets pregnant with Felicity Joy, and she goes, oh no, the baby's gonna, you know, take over my room. So their space is a symbol for their role, and by extension, it is a symbol of their power. Now, um, we see that this kind of metaphor, I shouldn't call it a metaphor, I should call it an analogy. This analogy extends to a, a bunch of locations or um, facets to do with location in the dressmaker. Because the hill, we see that it reflects the role of the people who live in it because they occupy the moral high ground, but at the same time, they are the, heavily, they are the most heavily scrutinized of the town. We also see that physical proximity represents social proximity, and that kind of stands in both texts, but we'll talk about it in The Dressmaker first. So in The Dressmaker, physical proximity is tied to social proximity in that the houses that are further apart from the rest of the town are occupied by the ones who aren't really, um, aren't really openly um, acknowledged and accepted as, you know, being part of the community by the rest of the town. So we have Tilly and Molly up on that hill who are outcasts, and then we have the Beaumonts who live far apart from the rest of the town and also think they're too good for everyone else. Um, now in the Crucible, proximity is also tied, uh, physical proximity is also tied to social proximity because we see that despite the fact that the Proctors live largely moral lives. They're seen as outcasts because they live further away from everyone else, and they're also um, not avid churchgoers. If you studied this text in the past, or if you studied Year of Wonders the year before, you'd know that a lot of these ideas about space also apply to the, um, also apply to Year of Wonders. In fact, I would almost say it seems as if um, the dressmaker in Year of Wonders would have made a better 
uh, pair of texts for comparison because they're so similar. Um, but who knows? Who am I to question the powers that be? I just really hate The Crucible, you guys. It's a horrible text. It's so self-indulgent. But anyway, um, we also see that dilapidated spaces provide the backdrop against which we compare Tilly's elegance and sophistication in The Dressmaker. Um, and it's a little bit dilap it's a little bit different from the dilapidation that we see in the crucible because dilapidation in the dressmaker kind of is that backdrop for us to compare her with. But in the crucible, dilapidation is about the haphazardness of McCarthy era justice. So once again, we know that Arthur Miller was not able to openly criticize McCarthyism, so he created the witch hunt as a metaphor for it. We see that despite the fact that it's a very primitive town, he never openly references the haphazardness of the structures until he starts talking about the courtroom. So specifically in the courtroom, we see that the boards are, you know, uneven widths, things are lopsided, and that tells us that that court of law should not be officially um, recognized because it ingrains in us this kind of feeling of it being shoddy, being haphazard, um, being, you know, kind of unofficial. So that's how dilapidation is kind of shown in the two texts, and they serve very different purposes, but you can say that both of them use it in some way. So that is all for today. It was a longer chapter. We hate that for me because I'm taking a winter intensive and I'm very busy, um, but you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you guys learned something and I will see you next time.